Like, okay, very good. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to continue. Hopefully, I had a little chance to think about hypercubes. Uh, so, I wanted to continue on what hypercubes say. They seem to say a lot. So, I want to say just a little bit about another way to think about uh, the hypercube. So, you can think of a hypercube. So, a hypercube is a two by two by two matrix. Which you can think of, you can think of as a as a quadrilinear form. Quadrilinear form on on a product of four four two dimensional vector spaces. So say on v one cross v two cross v three cross v four where these vi are two-dimensional vector spaces. Vector spaces. So we have a quadrilinear form on, on a product of four two-dimensional vector spaces. And the way to see these genus one curves uh, that I was mentioning yesterday uh, is as follows. You can you can define, right, let's say, oh, that would be great. I don't know. Oh, wow. There's a lot of lights. Okay. It's good? Yeah, it's Okay. Things are good, Barry. It's okay, Barry. I think it's okay, Barry. Yeah, it seems like the light showed up. Thanks. <laughs> okay. okay, so if we have a quadrilinear form and a product of four two-dimensional vector spaces, then one can define a set C12. Uh, it's going to be in PV1 cross PV2. Okay, where PV1 is like a projective line. PV2 is a projective line. So the projectivization of these vector spaces. Uh, if you take the product of PV1 cross PV2, we're going to define a genus 1 curve inside that product as follows. So we take C12 is going to be the set of all V1 comma V2. Okay. So this V1 comma V2 is in V1 cross V2, but in fact you can think of it uh, in PV1 cross PV2. Okay, so this is like a P1 cross P1. Okay, so this is going to be a set in P1 cross P1. And how is it, uh, how's, so which V1s and V2s, namely, so, so let's call this, this quadrilinear form T. Okay, so T is the name of our quadrilinear form. So we're going to take all V1 comma V2 and V1 cross V2 such so that T of V1 comma V2. Okay, so the T is a quadrilinear form, but now we stuck in two vectors into it, and so now it's just a bilinear form. And we can ask whether that bilinear form is singular. Yeah, right? If you write in terms of basis, whether it's, so whether its determinant is, is zero. So like this. Okay, so this, this is naturally in a P1 cross P1, namely it's in PV1 cross PV2. Right. So, so it's like a P1 cross P1. Okay, so we're taking all the pairs v1 comma v2 and v1 cross v2 such that if you plug them into this quadrilinear form, the bilinear form you have left over is singular. It has determinant zero. And if you think about uh, the equations for, if you were writing down the equations for this curve, well, it's sort of a, it's a 2, 2 form on p1 cross p1, so it gives you a genus 1 curve. So c12 is a genus 1 curve for sort of a generic t. So this is going to be a genus 1 curve. So, in other words, it's a 2-2 it's a two -two form. It's a by degree 2-2 two -two form. So, it gives you a genus 1 curve in P1 cross P1. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so that's the way hypercube gives you a genus one curve. But this genus one curve came from by choosing these first two coordinates. But we, can we could have chosen any two coordinates. And that would have given uh, different genus one curves in PVI cross PVJ. So in general, you get, in general, you get a CIJ uh, in PVI cross PVJ. And so you end up with four choose two equals six genus one curves right, in the various P1 cross P1s, in the various PVI cross PVJs. Right? Okay, so that's, so that's a way of taking a hypercube and producing six genus one curves in P1 cross P1. Um, okay, so then the natural question arises, well, are these, are these isomorphic curves? And what's, are, they in the, are they isomorphic embeddings into P1 cross P1? So, so here's how you can show that they're actually all isomorphic curves. But uh, it's going to turn out that they're not isomorphic embeddings into P1 cross P1, but they are isomorphic curves. And the reason is, okay, so here's a way, so here's a way to see that, say, C12 and C23 are isomorphic. So you can define a map, say, phi from C12 to C23. Uh, as follows, so if you have a, if you have a point v1, comma v2 on the c12, so if you have a, a v1, v1, comma v2 on this curve c12, uh, and you plug it into the quadrilinear form, right, this is now, well, by definition of c12, this is now a singular matrix, a singular 2 by 2 matrix. And if it's a singular 2 by 2 matrix, uh, as long as t is not a very degenerate thing, if it's a singular two by two matrix, generically it's going to have rank one, and so you can take a kernel. You can take it on the left or on the right. Okay, we'll take it on the left. So you can take the left kernel, in other words, the V3 kernel. So you send V1, V2 to the left kernel of T of V1, comma V2, dot, dot. In other words, you take the V3, that will make this identically zero. Right? So, so maybe another way, to, another way to say this is, is the V3 in V3 such that T of V1 comma V2 comma V3 dot is identically zero. Right, so, when you, so a v1, v2 is on c12 exactly when, when you plug it into this quadrilinear form, you get a singular bilinear form. And so that has a kernel. So you, can, so you look for the v3 that causes this to become identically zero, and that is the map. Uh, um, v2, yeah, so v2, comma v3, I should say. You're right, thank you. So v2, comma, <laughs> left kernel. <laughs> okay, so, so that's the v2, comma v3. So that's that, uh, v3 and v3 with, with this property. Okay. And that is a natural map from c12 to c23. Okay. Because the v2 comma v3, that, so okay, so we took v2, v1 comma v2, and we replaced it with v2 comma v3, where v3 was the thing that made this identically zero. And that is going to be on the curve c23, because if you had v2 comma v3 here, v1 would have been in the kernel. And so v2 comma v3 would have been in c23. <laughs> okay. So, so this map is actually defining, uh, it is taking C12 to C23 because it's sending you to a V2 comma V3 such that if you put a plug in the V2 comma V3, that was a singular two by two matrix because V1 is there in the kernel. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. So that is, uh, that is another thing to do. But then when, if you, yeah, so that's, that's, another, that's another thing to do. So you can, right, so you can define curves in P1 cross P1 cross P1, right, C1, 2, 3 inside P1 cross P1 cross P1 by, by the condition that T of V1 comma V2 comma V3 is identical zero. So that's, a, that's another thing you can do. Uh, okay, so, so here are six uh, genus one curves in various P1 cross P1s, and they're all isomorphic. Yeah. Uh, over Z, I don't know. I'm just, I just meant over a field for now. 
Oh, so now this is overkill. Yeah, this is all overfill. Yeah. Um, okay, so so what that means is that okay, so so for every C I J we have a map to C J K. Okay. And so here's a so here are the six curves. <laughs> and all the various lines there are the isomorphisms that I was just uh, discussing. And so now the question is, well, what happens if you well, so you can start at C12 and you can start going to doing your isomorphism to C23 and then do an isomorphism to C24 and work your way and work your way back to C12. And the question is, do you end up, so if you go in some, some path and come back to C12, is that the identity? <laughs> or do, do weird things happen? And the first time I thought about this, I said, surely it has to be the identity. How could weird things happen? But of course, weird things do happen. <laughs> so, so as Danny already mentioned, if you go from C12 to C23 to C13 to C12, by the description that we just sort of made, they're all sort of, that's going to be the identity because it's just corresponding to a curve in P1 cross P1 cross P1 with the property that uh, T V1, V2, V3 dot is identically zero. So any sort of monochromatic triangle here that you go on results in getting the identity map. So if you start at C12 and go to C23 and then go to C13 and then go to C12, uh, that's the identity. But if you go on, on a triangle that has different colors, for example, this one, if you go C12, C24, C23, C12, and you work out that map, it's not the identity. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's an involution. On the, uh, so C12 is in P1 cross P1, and so it has two natural involutions, uh, corresponding to the two maps to the two P1s. And these, this non-monochromatic triangle and this non-monochromatic triangle uh, give you the two involutions corresponding to the two double covers of P1 that the genus 1 curve in P1 cross P1 gives. Uh, OK, so, so, so you get these various involutions. But OK, now suppose you do a quadrilateral <laughs> that has all different colors, because there are four different colors here. Uh, so if you, do, if you do a quadrilateral that has uh, four different colors, so for, uh, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So here's one, OK, so right here, yeah, OK, so this one, you go like that, right, so that has four different colors. Uh, and if you do that, you go around that, that also is not the identity, so you start here and you go along this quadrilateral that has four different colors. And any time you go along a quadrilateral that has four different colors, you end up translating your genus one curve by a point on the Jacobian. So it's a, it's a very non-trivial map. Uh, it's more than just an involution, you actually end up uh, you actually end up translating your genus one curve by a point on the Jacobian. Um, it could be either. Yeah. Uh, it will be if, if T is not is not non-degenerate in a in a natural sense. If its discriminant is non-zero, then it will be a non-zero point. It will always be a non-zero point, but it could be a torsion point or it could be an infinite order point. And and so one works out. Okay, so so you sort of have to sort of start thinking about the homotopy of this, and this gives you a map into the <laughs> into the automorphisms of your uh, genus one curve. Some correspond to involutions and some correspond to translations by points on the Jacobian. And uh, if you look, it turns out that you essentially get two independent points that are being translated around. So, so the data of a hyperliptic curve not only gives you an isomorphism class of genus 1 curve, but it also comes with some extra data, namely points on the Jacobian. And so once you analyze exactly what the relations are, uh, uh, between these various fat pads that you can take, starting at, at a given curve, Cij, uh, uh, you work out what the relations are between those various pads, and you end up proving that they're sort of uh, there's sort of two independent points on the Jacobian that are coming there, and the rest are, are, are related. So, okay, so here's the theorem that one ends up proving. So, uh, this is joint with Wei Ho. As I said, all these all these uh, parameterizations are joint work with Wei Ho. Uh, so the theorem is that if you have any field K uh, with characteristic not equal to 2, although you can say something in that case too, but that's kind of a pain, uh, and you look at the space of hypercubes, so K2, tensor K2, tensor K2, tensor K2, modulo the action of row operations, column operations, and the other direction operations, and the other direction operations, <laughs> uh, that those things are in one-to-one -one correspondence with C. C is a genus 1 curve. Uh, and then uh, you have a uh, degree two line bundle that corresponds to, say, uh, what, 
one of the double covers, so realizing, so the genus one curve can be realized as a double cover of P1 in a number of ways. We pick one of them, call it L1. Uh, and then starting with that one, we get three points on the Jacobian in the way I described by, by going around in loops on this, uh, uh, on that uh, set of maps there. Uh, so we naturally get a degree two line bundle together with three uh, points on the Jacobian, non-zero points on the Jacobian, with the relation that P2 plus P3 plus P4 is zero. So another way to think of it is what the data that you're getting really is you're getting a genus one curve, you're getting a degree two line bundle, and then you're getting two points on the Jacobian. <laughs> Uh, that are non-zero. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, distinguish the twist of C. Right. It's uh, isomorphism uh, over K. Isomorphism classes over K. Yeah. So it's a genus one curve over K, right? So in this theorem, the way I stated it, uh, so weird things happen if you look at, I mean, for example, if you've looked at the zero hypercube, this is not true, <laughs> what I'm saying. So you have to look at uh, uh, just the non-degenerate uh, hypercubes, and then for those non-degenerate hypercubes, uh, this is the statement that the non-degenerate hypercubes, so non-degenerate means that a certain discriminant doesn't vanish. Uh, then this is the, this is the a statement uh, of a solution to an orbit problem, namely, what are the orbits of hypercubes under the national group action? And they correspond to genus one curves, a degree two line bundle, and two points on the Jacobian. And that's, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's the solution to this orbit problem corresponding to hypercubes. And as I mentioned yesterday, this is sort of the, one of the two mothers of all co-regular spaces. And so if you sort of understand this one, then you start understanding uh, the orbits of lots of co-regular spaces uh, via the same operations that I talked about yesterday. So you can start building this web of co-regular spaces now in the same way that we did pre-imaging vector spaces on the first day. And one starts to understand various co-regular spaces in terms of genus one curves. So for example, you can talk about symmetrizing these hypercubes. For example, you could quadruply symmetrize the hypercube. Okay, so there's a, so what does that mean? That means that if you hold the hypercube on its diagonal, A and D, and you rotate it, it has its order four rotational symmetry, if you can visualize this in four dimensions. Uh, but here's a picture of it, right? So if you hold this hypercube along, uh, a and E, and you rotate it in four dimensions, it has an order four uh, symmetry, and that hypercube, if you, uh, this hypercube that I made there will go back into itself under that order four symmetry. Uh, yeah, the symmetry is big, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so under that full S4 symmetry, when you hold it along AE, yeah. But in particular, once you're fixed under the cyclic thing, then you're, uh, is that true? I don't know. Maybe there's another one. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's actually another very interesting space. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So under the full. Okay. So you hold along AE and you look at the full. You want it to be symmetric under the full S4. Uh, then you get uh, you get this hypercube. Uh, and so there are only f there are only five coefficients that matter A, B, C, D, and E, and they fit naturally into a binary quartic form. In, in other words, if you if you act by GL2Z on this. Uh, quadruply symmetric hypercube, that's equivalent to acting on this binary quartic form. Kind of like when we looked at triply symmetric cubes, those corresponded to binary cubic forms, which is in turn is a generalization of this fact that when we talk about square matrices that are symmetric, those are binary, those are, sorry, those are quadratic forms. Okay, so if you have a, if you have a four-dimensional matrix and you look at its total, totally symmetric case, you get uh, a binary quartic form. And so what that theorem now specializes to in the case of, of totally symmetric things it's a statement about binary quartic forms under the action of GL2. But these special binary quartic forms where you have four, six, four, six, and four in, in, as coefficients there. So, so the, the totally symmetric case ends up corresponding uh, uh, to the following. Uh, so you look at binary quartic forms with, that are one, four, six, four, one type, uh, modulus the action of GL2, and those correspond to a genus one curve, a degree two line bundle. And and this, uh, this relation that, uh, so P2 and P3 and P4 are all going to uh, turn out to be the same, and they sum to zero. So what that ends up doing is that, 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 three tor that uh, when we were going around in that cycle that had four different colors, we were adding a point on the Jacobian. That point on the Jacobian will have to be three torsion, okay? because, because of this theorem P2 plus P3 plus P4. They'll all be the same, the PIs, and they add up to zero. 
So one works out that one's always translating by a three torsion point in that case. And so binary quartic forms parameterize uh, genus one curve, degree two line bundle, and a three torsion point on the Jacobian. Uh, which is kind of curious. What do yeah. you mean by that special subgroup? Oh, this is the, <laughs> can you explain? <laughs> it's, the, it's this period index thing. Uh, yeah. It's a finite index thing, so it's not, uh, I mean, it doesn't cause any. I always thought about these things over the complex numbers, and then you don't see this, but when you go to, when you go to a general field, then you have to watch for this period index subgroup uh, issue. Uh, okay. Uh, so this, this theorem is kind of curious because it's kind of, this has to do, this is kind of related to the duality uh, that, uh, that happened for binary cubic forms where you had binary cubic forms parameterize both cubic rings and they parameterized order three ideal classes and quadratic rings. Well here, remember binary quartic forms, first of all, they obviously parameterize genus one curves with a degree two line bundle, right? Because binary quartic form, if you have binary quartic form, it gives you four points in P1 and then you can make the double cover that ramifies at those four points. And so binary quartic forms, in the most natural sense, they parameterize uh, genus one curves together with a degree two line bundle. But they also parameterize degree <laughs> genus one curves with a degree two line bundle and a three torsion point on the Jacobian. Somehow those are isomorphic <laughs> moduli spaces, although it's not clear why to me, except through this. So that's kind of a nice problem to understand how exactly those, those two moduli spaces are related. Uh, okay. So one can do uh, all sorts of other kinds of symmetry. As we already noted, there are various kinds of quadruple symmetry too. That was the total quadruple symmetry. One can also impose two, two-fold symmetry. And if one imposes uh, this kind of just two-fold symmetry, in other words, we just symmetrize two of the factors. Uh, so we replace K2 tensor K2 tensor K2 tensor K2 with uh, just K2 tensor K2 tensor sim2 K2. Okay, so two by two matrices of binary quadratic forms, then the results you get is that that sets doubly symmetric hypercubes modulo the action of GL2 cubed, uh, uh, parameterize genus one curves, a degree two line bundle, and just a single point on the Jacobian instead of two points on the Jacobian. So, so you can parameterize genus one curves with two points on the Jacobian. You can, uh, you can parameterize genus one curves with one point on the Jacobian. Uh, and this, as I'll talk about tomorrow, that's very useful. You can decide how many marked points you want on your Jacobian. Should and it be a point that does not have order two? It doesn't have, uh, yeah, it's just a general point. It could be any, uh, you can get any non-zero point on the Jacobian. But then you have T plus T plus a third point is zero? Um, well, Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, uh, well, they're kind of four, they're kind of four points around. Uh, yeah, okay, this, one has to work through it. Yeah, it's not, uh, I can't give a very quick, you want to say? Okay. <laughs> it's analogous to, yeah, I mean, yesterday when we had the, the cube, right, and you had a doubly symmetric cube, it was, the, it was the same kind of thing. You had three points that were summing to zero, but two of them were the same. And so, yeah, once you know... condition that all three points were non-zero. Oh, you're saying the... So, if you have two of them equal... Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> oh, okay, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it, what's the... How do you... Uh, so his objection is that how can it be, if none of them are allowed to be zero, then why can't uh, one of them be two torsion? If one of them was two torsion, then the third one would end up being zero, right? Because the sum of it and itself would be zero. It can't be a two torsion, is what Hendrik is. They were, yeah, but somehow here it doesn't, yeah, yeah, right. So here you only get non-zero stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when, when, when one point ends up being zero, then the, the hypercube you end up making, I mean, it's not totally parallel, so the hypercube you end up making ends up being degenerate. 
when 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 you make one of the points here. So. So it's not yeah it's not exactly parallel but it's sort of an analogy. So I seem to remember that you could get any point, but uh, I don't. See it. From what you're saying, I also. Mm. No, but what if you're doing this over C and there is no period index problem? So. Okay, so <laughs> good question. <laughs> I don't know the answer of it. <laughs> okay, uh, so it may be that order two points don't come. I, can't see the reason why. Okay, so, okay, so three by three by three uh, is the other mother of co-regular spaces, and so one can start there and start doing uh, similar similar things. So if you have a, a Rubik's cube, you can slice that into three three by three matrices, uh, as follows. Right. So if you have a cube, you can think of a cube as as three three by three matrices, and that you can do in the same for the same reason. Uh, you can do that in three different ways. And, and then the same trick. Well, if you have three three by three matrices, you should multiply the first by an indeterminant, and the second by another indeterminant, and a third by a, yet a third indeterminant, add them and take the determinant. And when you do that, right, if you have three three by three matrices, then you break it up like this, and then you take the determinant of the first times x plus the second times y plus the third times z, uh, you get a ternary cubic. Right? And so, so anytime you have a three by three by three matrix, uh, it spits out three plane cubics. And, and for the same reason that I explained to you in the hypercube case, these three uh, ternary cubics uh, cut out, uh, cut out uh, in the plane cut out isomorphic genus one curves. Uh, and for a very similar reason, except instead of that complicated isomorphism diagram, you just have, well, you have a C12 and a C23 and a C31, and you just have isomorphism going like this, given by taking kernels. And so there's only one kind of, it's a much easier homology problem now. Uh, you can only wind around in, uh, in sort of uh, one way. And so you really just get one point on the Jacobian. <laughs> so you, have, you get a plane, so you get a genus one curve with a degree three line bundle, since you're embedding the thing in the plane, uh, together with one point on the Jacobian. That has to be non-zero, again, for similar reasons. So, so the result is, and this, uh, this is essentially contained in a PhD thesis of, of Kakan Ng, and he proved it over the complex numbers, but you can do the same thing over any field. And so what you get is that uh, K3 tensor K3 tensor K3, in other words, the space of Rubik's cubes, uh, modulo GL3 cubed, uh, they, these, those orbits parameterize a genus one curve, a degree three line bundle, and, uh, and a non-zero point on the Jacobian. So that's what three by three uh, cubes parameterize. And and just to, to show you that this is a co-regular space, if you work out the invariance for this action of SL3 cubed on Rubik's cubes, it turns out that the degrees are 6, 9, and 12 of the invariance, freely generated by three polynomials of degrees 6, 9, and 12. And what do those uh, 6, 9, and 12 mean? So the six turns out to be, if you're thinking in Weierstrass form, you're putting your Jacobian in Weierstrass form, form of this genus one curve C, then you're getting a point on the Jacobian, and the coordinates of that point on the Jacobian are exactly these degree six and degree nine invariants. So y, y is the degree nine invariant, x is the degree six invariant. And then you have your a4 and a6 of the, of the elliptic curve. The a4 is given by uh, this tw degree 12 invariant, and then and then you have a degree 18 invariant, which is related to the 6, 9, and 12, and that's your A6. So these invariants that come out uh, in all these parameterizations, they mean something very nice in terms of, of what's being parameterized. They correspond to the coordinates, they correspond to the A4 and A6 of the elliptic curve, uh, and so on. Yeah, so... Okay, so once, you sort of, once one sort of understands these two, uh, these two basic cases, the hypercubes and the Rubik's cubes, then again, one can start the same, a similar game that we did in the prima genius case. So you have these various operations uh, that I talked about in the prima genius case. And so you start building this web of co-regular spaces, uh, and they parameterize, uh, they parameterize various different things. There are now all sorts of ways to symmetrize, since the hypercube has way more symmetry, for example. Uh, as well as skew symmetrize and Hermitianize, and so they're all, okay, so this, 
I was trying. <laughs> I was trying yesterday to make the diagrams, <laughs> but uh, I got lost. Okay, because they're now there's just so many uh, there's so many directions in which uh, which one can go, and I, it wasn't clear which two dimensional slices to take that made made, made it look nice. So <laughs> so instead here's okay so so again these are just heuristics, just like in the primogenius case. These are sort of heuristics. You have a representation theory a heuristic that tells you how to get to a new co-regular space, and then you have your on your algebraic side. You have your heuristic that tells you what, what new objects should be parameterized. For example, if you do skew symmetrization, uh, the line bundles uh, become vector bundles. Uh, uh, that's the guess, and then you have to you have to again prove it in each in each case. Uh, so we've now proved it in, in in many cases, and here's a list of some of those cases. So sorry not to make it in web form, but <laughs> okay. So. So that first representation is just regular binary quartic forms, and binary quartic forms, of course, correspond to a, a genus one curve and a degree two line bundle. But if you look at the dual representation of that top one, which comes later, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down, right? Then that's the that's the dual representation that corresponds to a genus one curve, a degree two line bundle, and a three torsion point on the Jacobi. Uh, so those are those two cases I mentioned. Uh, uh, the, third, the third entry is the, the hypercube. So that corresponds to a genus one curve, a degree two line bundle, and two points on the Jacobian, as you see there. Uh, and then this, uh, this fourth column here gives the, gives the degrees of the invariants. And all these invariants have natural interpretations uh, in terms of the objects being parameterized. So you'll notice that it's kind of similar to the pre homogeneous case, these last two, you have one line for sort of degree four line bundles and degree five line bundles. <laughs> they sort of come over here, but then you have a bunch of cases for degree two line bundles and a bunch of cases for degree three line bundles uh, or, or vector bundles. So the, the, when, I, when we say Li there, Li just means uh, a, a line bundle of degree i. So L2s are degree two line bundles, L3s are degree three line bundles. Okay. But this space here parameterizes degree four line bundles, this space parameterizes degree five line bundles on, on genus one curves. So these, these two invariants here correspond sort of to the A4 and the A6 of the genus 1 curve. And notice they're in, de, in ratios 2 to 3, okay, as you would expect. Uh, the, the M26 there, M26 means a, a vector bundle of dimension 2 and degree 6. Uh, and then there's some, there's some weird stuff that I don't totally understand. I think Wei understands better, but still, we, we don't really understand very well. But you get, you get embeddings of... Some of these spaces are really cool. They give embeddings of genus one curves into, say, the octonionic projective plane. <laughs> and so one can sort of use these things to understand embeddings of curves into, into weird places, not just uh, projective spaces that we normally see, but projective spaces over the quaternions and over the octonions. OK, so there, there are lots of, such, lots of such cases. OK. Really, very a very symmetric way of phrasing any of these because because of the fact that uh, you have this non-commutativity in the in the diagrams of the uh, of the maps between those. So you can sort of say, yeah. There's no really nice, totally symmetric way to say it because you have to choose where you start. Yeah. So for example, in this diagram here, uh, because of the fact that when you start at C12 and go to C23 and C31 and come back. You're not at the same place where you started. So all three of these things are not simultaneously defined. And so if you, if you phrase it in a symmetric way, then, well, you couldn't, you couldn't mention all three of these simultaneously. That's the problem, because if you mention all three simultaneously, they're not simultaneously defined, <laughs> because the map that goes around is not. So you have to sort of start in one place and say, OK, here's my degree two line bundle. And then now what happens you know, when I go around and, and say, OK, here's, I start with this curve. I call that my genus one curve. And then when you go around, you get a point on its Jacobian. And, that's, and so it ends up being a slightly non-symmetric way of saying it, but you need to do that. You have to break the symmetry because you need to understand what happens when you go around in these, these circles. <laughs> but that's where I was kind of disappointed in the beginning that there wasn't any nice symmetric way to say it. But on the other hand, if it was, there was a symmetric way to say it, then you, 
all this extra great information about the homology that gives you these points on the Jacobian would, uh, well, would not have been there then. Uh, okay. So actually, it's, it's, yeah, that extra, the fact that you can't say it symmetrically is where actually a lot of the structure that's used later uh, ends up being very important. Okay. So, okay, so, so I want to talk about some of the applications today, and then tomorrow I'll, I'll really get into what, uh, what these things say. Uh, but again, just like in the primogenous case, uh, we can use these co-regular co representations to understand sort of the uh, arithmetic statistics of the objects that are being parameterized. Uh, in this case, uh, elliptic curves and, and models of those elliptic curves. Uh, the genus one curve, sorry. So, so let, let's just fix to the field k equals q for now, although you could take any number field and the same ideas would apply. Uh, the point is that since these are kind of geometric objects, we usually think of these objects over the rational numbers. Uh, when we we're talking about primogenous vector spaces, instead of thinking about fields, we could think about orders. Here, when we're thinking about algebraic uh, curves, we usually think of them over fields. You can think about models over z, and this, these things say a lot about models over z. But first, we want to understand the rational orbits, but our techniques for counting, or in geometry of numbers, count, in, count integer points, naturally. Right? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to understand the rational orbits, but we'll, to count the rational orbits, we'll count integral orbits. So the problem is that integral orbits and rational orbits are different. There can be many integer orbits corresponding to the same rational orbit. And also, it's not obvious that every rational orbit that has given invariance will actually have an integral representative that has those invariants. Uh, so these are problems one has to overcome when counting uh, rational orbits in these spaces. Uh, and that's something I'll get to tomorrow. Uh, OK, so I want to talk a little bit about how one counts, uh, counts points uh, in these spaces, integer orbits in these co-regular spaces. So I was telling the story yesterday about how, so originally when I was trying to count uh, orders in quartic fields, I made this fundamental domain explicitly with degree 12 polynomials and 12 variables. And once one gets to the Quinta case, one realizes that this is not going to be uh, feasible because you have degree 40 polynomials and 40 variables that are defining your fundamental domain. So a technique had to be developed where you don't actually have to write any of these things down, but sort of understand it just from the group theoretic perspective. And that's what I uh, want to talk about, how to generalize this to, um, to co-regular spaces, that method of counting in primogenous vector spaces that I described just briefly yesterday. So, so here's the situation. So suppose G is a reductive group, and we'll always let GS denote the semi-simple part. Okay, so for us, GS will just be a product of SLs, and G will be a product of GL, GLs and SLs. Okay. So, okay, so we'll restrict ourselves to the co-regular case. So we'll take a co-regular representation, V of G. In other words, the ring of invariance, relative invariance is, uh, is free, generated by, say, the invariance I1 through IK. And we'll say I1 through IK, these invariant polynomials, have degrees uh, D1 through DK. And just one more notation, D will, be, D will denote the lowest common multiple of the DI, the degrees of the invariants. Okay. So what we're interested in counting are points of bounded height. So how do we define the height? The height of a point uh, in this representation will just be the maximum of the values of the invariants at that point. Okay. But because they're different degrees, uh, we take appropriate power so that they're the same degree so that they're comparable. Okay. So the height of a point in a co-regular representation is just defined to be the maximum of the size, of absolute, I should put absolute values there, uh, maximum of the absolute values of the invariants raised to the appropriate powers so that they're comparable, so that they have the same degrees. Okay. So you raise, uh, So we raise I sub J to D over DJ, so that uh, they all have degree D. Okay. And so our problem is that we're interested in counting the number of orbits under the action of the integral group on the, on the lattice of integral points that have height less than X. Okay. Right, so when we were, for example, yesterday, when we were talking about binary cubic forms, we wanted to understand there was just one invariant to the discriminant, and we were interested in counting the GL2 
orbits of binary cubic forms that had height, in other words, discriminant, less than x. Okay, so this is the natural, uh, natural generalization of that to co-regular spaces. Okay, any questions about that setup? Okay, so, okay, so how do we go about doing this in practice? So we do this by counting integer points of bounded height inside fundamental domains for the action of the integral group on the real vector space, okay, on the real representation. Right, just like for binary cubic forms, right? We had real binary cubic forms, and then we modded out by the action of GL2Z, and we found a fundamental domain for that. So just like in the previous, and then we just want to count the number of integer points in those fundamental domains. So that's sort of the goal. But just as in the prima genus cases, uh, of course, the problems are now intensified. Uh, these domains are not compact, but they have complex, very intricate-looking cusp systems that go off to infinity. Uh, but sort of motivated by the prima genus cases where this always happened. What always happened was that most of the degenerate points would end up lying in the cusps. Most of the points that you were interested in ended up being in the main body, and that's what uh, we would suspect continues to happen. The cusps are very thin. They would contain lots of points only if there's some subvariety that sort of goes into the cusps and, and catches just things that are degenerate uh, for, for some algebraic reason. So that's what uh, uh, one tries to show in those cases. So this generalization to co-regular spaces, this refinement of those counting methods, is a joint work with, uh, uh, with Ariel Schenker. Uh, and it goes as follows. OK, so. OK, so how do we construct fundamental domains? So first of all, we let f be a fundamental domain. Uh, for the action of GZ on GR. GZ denotes the integral points of the group on the real points of the group by, by left multiplication. So we let F be a fundamental domain for the action of GZ on GR. So that's the first, kind of, that's the first ingredient in constructing a fundamental domain. The second ingredient is we make a fundamental domain for the action of GR on VR. So first we made a fundamental domain for the action of GZ on GR, and now we make a fundamental domain for the action of GR on VR. And we do it in such a way that uh, that set S is compact. And it's not obvious that you can always do that, and in fact there's some representations where I think you can't. Uh, but in representations that have uh, good behavior, this, you can always arrange this, that S lies in a compact set. And now, if you think about it, so f is kind of gr mod gz, and s is kind of like vr mod gr. So if you multiply f and s, that'll give you a fundamental domain for gz on vr. So this, this is going to, you think of it as a multiset. You multiply that fundamental domain for the group by this fundamental do domain for the action of the real group on the real vector space. And that's going to be a union of finitely many fundamental domains for the action of GZ on VR. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, your thing has the Ah, right, right. Yeah, this is a good question. So, the J invariant you can think of as a quotient of two things, right? And the reason the J invariant is not bounded is because sometimes the bottom gets large. <laughs> And sometimes, the, when the, and sometimes the top gets large. So when the top gets large, you're close to zero. When the bottom gets large, you're close to, uh, in, sorry, the other way around. So when the, top, when the top gets large, your J invariant gets large. And when the bottom gets large, your J invariant gets small. Uh, but so those are two, those are going to be two independent invariants in, in these spaces. So you can let, so you can write it as a union of two compact oh, things. Of yeah, yeah, it's like P1 can be covered by two affines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, okay, so. So we make, this, we make this fundamental domain by taking a fundamental domain for the group and multiplying it with a fundamental domain for sort of the, the set of invariants. Okay. And, and that makes a fundamental domain for the action of VR on GZ. Okay. And it's exactly this set FS, this is going to be our fundamental domain, that turns out to be highly non-compact. And you have to deal with its tentacles that go off to infinity. And and so the point I want to make is that if you just write down a single, uh, a single set f times s, uh, it's going to be very difficult to count points in just that single non-compact region. Because writing down 
uh, the equations for the boundaries of this region uh, is, is not feasible. So the point is that we don't want to stick to just one uh, fundamental set. So the idea is to average over a continuum of fundamental regions. So, so here's, the, here's the main observation is that not only is F times S uh, a fundamental domain for the action of GZ on VR, but F times G times S, where G is any element of the real group, will also be a fundamental domain. So, you can, so in other words, we've taken that fundamental domain and we can perturb it by, uh, at multiplying by, by an element of the real group. So, so if, N, if NVX denotes the number of non-degenerate orbits on VZ having height less than X, then you can think of NVX as just the number of points in a fundamental region, F times G times S, uh, that, have height, that have height less than X. So, this is, so the total number of orbits of height less than X is just the number of integer points in a fundamental region that have height less than X. But the fundamental region, we have many of them. We can put any real element of the group G there, and that will be a fundamental region. And so let's, let's look at a range of little Gs, and that will give a range of fundamental domains. So we'll let G0 uh, be an open and bounded set inside, inside, inside the real group, G. And then we'll, we'll let that little G range through that little compact bounded set inside little G. And so that'll, that's going to be our perturbation of that fundamental domain into, lots of, uh, into a, continu a continuum of fundamental domains. So because of this equality we have here, we can now take this thing and average it over G and G0. Right? And since, well, every fundamental domain has the same number of points, okay, we'll still get the same, same number. Right? So we just, I just took that original thing and I just averaged it over G0. So you average over G0 with respect to higher measure, integrate it over all, uh, all little g's in G0, and then divide by the total measure of the g's that you're, you're averaging over. And so this is like an average of a constant. <laughs> okay? It turns out to be the same constant. Okay. <laughs> okay, so once you have it in this form, so now you, there's this additional parameter, G, that's going through this compact, um, this, this bounded set in G, in big G. Uh, and so we can now, right, we have this uh, continuum of points in F, right, which is the fundamental domain for the group, and then we have this extra parameter, G0, and now we can try to switch order of summation. So the standard uh, uh, analytic thing that you like to do, you want to switch order of summation, but of course you have to show that this, you know, that that's valid that you, when, you, when you switch order of summation. But in principle, that's what's going on. You're just switching order of summation. So now instead, we integrate over f instead in the numerator, and we put the g0 inside. Okay. So that's a, just a switching order of summation trick, as is usual in analytic number theory. But of course, you, this has to be justified. Uh, and one shows that in the cases that one's considering, uh, that this is a valid or, uh, switch in order of summation by certain analytic estimates. So, OK, so once you have it as an integral over f, so f is the thing, fundamental domain for the action, remember, uh, for the action of gz on gr. Okay, it's a fundamental domain for the group. And that's, that is well known to be compact. That's a famous thing, right? Like, for example, for binary cubic forms, it's gl2r mod gl2z. We understand the cusp of that. And so we can break that up into its cuspidal part and its sort of main body part. And when h is in the cusp of this fundamental domain, then what you have to argue is that then h times g0 times s will contain mostly degenerate points. But now this is a very concrete, uh, this is a concrete problem. We understand the group well, and so we look at cuspidal, uh, we parameterize the cusp of the group, and we look at the set, and then we try to argue that uh, that thing going off to infinity contains a certain hypersurface that corresponds to degenerate points. But in each case, it's a different degeneracy, and you have to sort of, uh, I mean, I always wondered whether there was some uh, sort of uniform thing that you can say across all representations. But in each representation, the kind of degeneracy you get is very different. It's an interplay of the algebra, algebraic object that's being parameterized, and the analysis of the, of the space. And you have to sort of consider both of them to understand uh, what degeneracies are going to lie in any given cusp. You have to understand both the algebra and the analysis of that, uh, of that cuspidal region. Uh, OK, so since S was chosen to lie in a compact set, right? that's the, that's the key point here. Then G0 is also bounded. So G0 times S is, is this bounded thing. And now, it's, so it's really H is controlling the whole tentacleness of, of this tentacle. <laughs> so G0 and S, because they're both chosen to be bounded, they don't contribute to that tentacleness. Okay. So we've isolated the tentacleness just in the group. That's, what's, uh, that's what uh, this trick allows us to do. 
So what we show is that if h is not in the cusp, then h times g0 times s, the number of integer points in there will be proportional to the volume, will be asymptotic to the volume, uh, plus a small error term. Okay, so when your region is round, then the number of integer points in your round region tends to be the volume. Number of integer points, right? Lattice points tends to be the volume. And when h is in the cusp, then you have this uh, tentacle, tentacly thing, and then you have to isolate this hypersurface that corresponds to degeneracy. Okay. And that you isolate by understanding the algebra of what's being parameterized. Uh, okay, so, so we treat the cusp separately, and we argue that those contain degenerate points. And then you look at the non-cuspidal points inside the fundamental domain for the group. And there we argue that since the region is kind of roundish, the number of integer points will be uh, about equal to the volume plus a small error. And hopefully small enough so that if you sum it over all h, it's still going to be small. And so this is where a lot of the analytic work has to be done to estimate what this error term is well enough so that, uh, so that when you sum it over, when you integrate it over all h in the main body of the fundamental domain, that error is still negligible. So once you prove those two things, then you have, okay, here's the averaging formula for for the, uh, for the number of points of bounded height uh, in the fundamental domain. And that, uh, that's, uh, that's the original averaging formula. And so what we end up getting is that we can estimate the number of integer points by just a volume of this fundamental region. Okay? So this is from that step from the second line to the third line came by arguing that the, some of those error terms that were coming when you're estimating the number of integer points in these regions by just the volumes, that they were negligible. Okay, so that's where a lot of the analytic work is, is from the second line to the third line. And so what ends up happening is that you, sh well, you show, because of this interaction of the algebra and the analysis, that the number of integer points that you're interested in, the non-degenerate points, does turn out to be equal to the volume of the fundamental region. And so all that's left to understand the sort of asymptotic distribution of, of points of bounded height is just to compute the volume. That's what all, in every case, it ends up being that, because the, the points where the, the, the regions of little h, the regions of little h where it wasn't true that the volume was estimating the number of integer points happened when there was a hypersurface of degeneracy going through that region. And that's what happens in every single case. And so it just amounts to computing the volume. And there's something really pretty that happens with the volume. Maybe I won't go through the whole thing, but let me just concentrate on this paragraph here, because it's really pretty. So if dv, so we're trying to, interested in the volume in the Euclidean sense. We, we have this fundamental domain in this real Euclidean space, and we want to understand the number of, uh, the volume of that region. If dv is the, the Euclidean measure on the region, then it turns out dv can be written uh, as a measure, you can do a change of measure to understand it as a measure on the group. Uh, and the formula for it is always, well, it's very pretty. So in the co-regular case, this is what happens, is that dv is just a constant times di1 times di2 dot 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 dik, where the, those were the invariants, times the Haar measure on the group, dg. And there's no other complicated function in front. It's really just a product of the d of the invariants times d of the group, the Haar measure. And that's, that's the Euclidean measure. So the, to change a variable formula from the vector space to the group uh, is just very, very pretty. It's just a product of the d invariants times the Haar measure on the group. And so this was Hendrik's question yesterday. Can we compute the volume in an easier way uh, for, of the fundamental domain? Do you have to write down the... So the way Davenport Hillbrand, for example, they, when they do their computation, they write down the explicit inequalities and do the integration. But if you translate to the group, you're just integrating d of the discriminant times the higher measure on SL2. And the higher measure on SL2 has this... Uh, for SLs, it's just a product of zeta values. And that's why you see zeta values always coming up as the volumes. So, so this is how one does a computation of the volume. You just translate it to a volume on the group, and since we're counting in a region where the height is bounded, it's very easy to do this integral right here. Okay. So, that's, uh, so that's how that uh, works. And so in particular, in the case of binary quartic forms, I'll just show you, so Jordan was asking, how do you make a compact fundamental domain? Here's an explicit one for binary quartic forms. <laughs> So uh, that set S that we were talking about, the, the fundamental region for GR acting on VR, uh, it's a union of these four lines. And, and so you can see those little unions. So th there are sort of four different kinds of binary quartic forms. Uh, ones that are totally real, right? They have all real roots, They're, or they have two pairs of complex roots. Uh, and then 
in the case of two pairs of complex roots, there are also two kinds of binary quartic forms, namely those that are positive definite, those that are negative definite. So that's why you have these four kinds of binary quartic forms. And for each one, you take your P1 of the J line and rip, write it as unions of affines. And that's what's, that's what's going on there. And so each one of those affines can, are now compact sets. Uh, and so that's why when we're analyzing the cusps of the fundamental regions constructed this way, you only have to care about the tentacleness of the group. You don't have to care about uh, tentacleness there. So I guess maybe. So I'm wondering whether to get into this or not, because how much time should I take? I don't know when I started. But Forty. Yeah. Okay. So I go for another five minutes. Okay. So. Okay. So. Maybe I'll just say a couple more things about uh, so that tomorrow I can talk about the the actual applications that arise. So maybe I'll just say quickly. So when you so we're interested in counting irreducible binary quartic forms. So we apply this method, and we do the averaging method that I just said, where this is our set S. We only have to know that the set S exists. We don't even need to, I mean, it wasn't really necessary to write it down. I just wanted to show you to show that you can always choose it to be compact. But you can argue that you can always choose this S to be compact. And so now you go through that averaging method that I said, where you choose a compact set inside your real group. And the way, uh, the way our fundamental domains are constructed, maybe, maybe I'll put that first. So the way our fundamental domains are constructed, is that, well, for example, for GL2, right, we're talking about binary quartic forms, you just use the usual Gauss fundamental domain for GL2R mod GL2Z, right, the, the guillotine-shaped region. <laughs> uh, so explicitly, you can write it as this product, right? You have your scalings, then you have your upper triangulars, and then you have your shears okay, times the compact. So that's the usual way of writing Gauss's fundamental region. And it's by, because of the shear, you kind of see uh, this is compact. This is compact okay, in Gauss's fundamental region. And it's only the shear that's infinite. So this is the cusp of GL2R, really, is that because you can, the cusp that goes off to infinity in Gauss's fundamental region is, right, is the shear where t goes to infinity. So because the shear is the thing that's causing the infiniteness of, of the fundamental region, what that amounts to saying is that in the fundamental, re any fundamental region you make this way, A times B times C times D times E is going to be bounded in terms of the height. If you're counting points up to height X, then A times B times C times D times E is going to be bounded because the shear, when it makes A small, it makes E large and they cancel. And they, you end up being something bounded. So if you're counting A, B, C, D, E of size at most O of X to the 5, 6, uh, well, because we're only counting irreducible things, A cannot be zero. So basically, uh, you can assume that all five of these things are non-zero if you're counting irreducible things, uh, because if one of the middle things are zero, those will be negligible in number. So since A is not equal to zero, the total number of, of such forms is going to be about O of X to the 5, 6 plus epsilon. Right? If you count the total number of A, B, C, D, E is non-zero, that multiply it to at most X to the 5, 6, you get X to the 5, 6 plus epsilon. And so this bound on the number of binary quartic forms of bounded height uh, is classical. It's due to uh, but not explicitly noted uh, by Julia, but it follows from Julia's reduction theory methods. But it was explicitly uh, proven in, in Yang's thesis uh, in 2009. And that, this bound follows from any reduction theory method automatically, because A, B, A times B times C times D times E is going to be at most uh, uh, a bound in terms of the height. Uh, and it turns out this is exactly uh, the issue concerning the average rank of all elliptic curves, say, being finite. If, if we knew that this epsilon wasn't there, then that would imply that the average rank of all elliptic curves is finite. That's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, and this averaging method is what allows you to shave off that epsilon. That's where all the, a lot of the hard work is, just, getting, just shaving an epsilon off. So using the average method to count points, uh, we show that the, the number of irreducible GL2Z orbits of binary quartic forms having bounded invariants, there are two invariants for the binary quartic case, uh, is equal to this explicit constant, 44 over 135 times zeta 2 times x to the 5, 6, uh, plus that lower order term. So it gives an exact asymptotic for the number of binary quartic forms 
having bounded height. So the binary cortex have two invariants, i and j. One is degree two and one is degree three. So having height less than x just means that i cubed and j squared is less than x. And that's why the asymptotics of that is x to the 5, 6. Uh, and the epsilon was all because of the cusp. The cusp contains more points than the main body. But if you can deal with the cusps, and that's what these techniques allow you to do, then you show that it's only the main body that's really mattering, and that's why the epsilon disappears. And so the correct order of growth of the number of binary quartic forms up to GL2Z equivalents is a constant times x to the 5, 6. And so what tomorrow I'm going to talk about is why that implies, once you've understood that there's no, there's no blowing up of the rank in the cusps, that the average rank of all elliptic curves is actually a finite number, and not an infinite number. And that's because of that epsilon being shaved off, and it's because of being able to deal with these, these cuspidal issues. Okay, so I guess I'll stop there. Thanks.